Shalom, beloved. Welcome to the Mighty Hand of God Ministries. I'm Scott Moore. And we are teaching, discussing, and opening up this new Jerusalem, Jerusalem in the Hebrew. Opening up this concept as to what the Lord has been purposing to get to us. Um, to get us to, if you will, to, to create us into this new creation is in reference to the new Jerusalem, the new place where God is desiring to abide and to make his abode, not just to visit, amen, but to dwell, to, to, to walk among us, amen, to, to move and, and have his being, amen, in us, amen. These earthen vessels being made into the house and even the city, of the living God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the presence of Yeshua, we ask that you would stretch out your hand to heal, to do miracles, signs, and wonders. Let everything, let everything that exhausts itself against the knowledge of God be cast down and brought low. And let the government and the revelation of the government of God be planted and built in the heart, soul, and strength of everyone viewing. I endure every strong man bound, every spirit of the anti-Messiah bound. I endure every unclean spirit to be cast out and expelled. Let all sickness and dis-ease be removed. And we thank you for your mercy. Amen. And amen. Someone's heart is being ministered to. There's a, a, a pressure right in the center that the Lord is ministering to. It feels a constricting, it feels a weak, and God is strengthening it. Be healed in the presence of Yeshua. Also, someone's back on the right side is being healed in the presence of Yeshua. The pain and the stiffness be healed. Amen. The right shoulder be healed in the presence of Yeshua. Amen. Let us go to the book of Revelation. The revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach. Given by Yochanan. Let me read it here. I like to read these, the titles of the books. It says, The revelation of Yeshua the Messiah to Yochanan, to John. Amen. It's a revelation given to John. We're going to read chapter 15. I'm going to read the whole chapter. It's not that long. But it has to do with the new Jerusalem. Now, in my dream, I, t I mentioned my dream in the last uh, episode, that I would dream that I was asked that this elderly woman who was the pastor of this fellowship sent one of her, um, her members her elders uh, to ask me if I would teach them about the New Jerusalem. I had not taught on that before, didn't have any notes to teach on that, and yet I said yes. Something about me in dreams, I always find myself saying yes, and even though I may not appear to be prepared, I just say yes, and then I see what happens, and then something great happens all the time. And so I said yes, and then I could not find the scripture as to where I thought the New Jerusalem was written in the scriptures. I thought it was in Revelation 19. And then I thought maybe it was in 15. And um, so I'm looking and then I'm thinking, well, maybe it's in, uh, after I woke up, I knew it was in Revelation 21. But... Um, but uh, then someone mentioned that it was in Acts chapter 5. And so all these things I'm taking notes of as I wake up because those are the chapters I'm actually going to. And I'm finding that each of those chapters makes a reference to the New Jerusalem. Even though um, 21, Revelation 21 is where, where I had perceived it um, the most. Um, I did not perceive it so much in Revelation chapter 3 even though I've read um, in regards to the Church of Philadelphia, uh, dozens of times, just to put it mildly, just dozens of times. I mean, there's 
one season of my life where I read it every day um, for months. So I'm just going to leave it at just dozens of times I've seen it. And yet the connection to the, the new Jerusalem was not so much the emphasis, at least it didn't appear to be at this point. Maybe then it was, but maybe not so much now. So anyway, so I'm looking at all these places in the dream and I can't find it. Every time I go to look in Revelation toward the end, toward uh, chapter 19 or 21 area, I get the maps. And so all I'm seeing is maps. And so I turn, I'm in the book of the Messianic Jews, which is Hebrews, and then I turn a page over and I'm in the maps. It's like, where did Revelation go? Like the whole book of Revelation just disappeared. Like, and so in a dream, so I just closed my Bible in the dream. And I just started preaching on what I knew about the New Jerusalem. Somebody's right kidneys being healed. Um, be healed in the presence of Yeshua. Receive your healing. And so I, um, I hold my hand up and I say the first thing about the New Jerusalem is that we see it descending from heaven. And when I held my hand up, I felt as if I touched heaven. Like the New Jerusalem is like right above my head, and then I reach my hand up, I'm in it. And so, like, the, it just felt this electricity. Um, it's like that breaker's anointing that uh, the Bishop Merritt talks about. If you're familiar with Bishop Merritt, he talks about the breaker's anointing, right? And so, that was the feeling I had. It's like, wow. And I was telling everybody that I'm ministering to, there was, um, I don't know, a few hundred people in there, and they're all looking at me just kind of like stone facing. No expression, no celebration, no nothing. So I'm the only one that has any kind of animation going on in this dream. And I'm just being all excited about it because I can feel it. And I'm like, wow, I can feel it right now. As I put my hand up, I'm feeling the, the kingdom of heaven. I can feel it. And so, um, so I'm explaining about how it's descending. It's not floating. It didn't fall. It's not, you know, it's not as if... We're going to be going up there, but it's coming down to us. And, and I'm talking about this, and, and the whole room from where I'm standing at, on the, it doesn't appear to be having any effect on them out there. But from where I was standing at, it was just overwhelming with the presence of God. And I was like, wow. So I just started having a conversation with the Lord right there in the dream. I was like, Lord, I hardly even said anything, and you're just overwhelming me up on that stage. And it's so, it's so amazing. And then I wake up. And so my impression was that, wow, I need to talk about New Jerusalem because this is awesome. You know, and, and that's how the Lord tends to move me in dreams. Because if he shows me something happening in a dream, then I'm like, all right, this is how the Lord operates. This is what he wants to do. And so I start imitating that <laughs> in the real world, <laughs> in this awakened world, you know. Um, you know, where my body is is at, you know, as opposed to just leaving it over there in dreamland. I'm trying to bring it through, you know, like, like my body is a type of portal that is able to go over into heaven and back, and back and forth and back and forth. Uh, one of the things that's mentioned in the Church of Philadelphia in uh, Revelation chapter 3 is that he will be a pillar in the temple of God and he will no longer go out. Amen. So there's this going in and out of heaven. So there's this place where God wants to bring us to, which we discussed over in Acts chapter 5 about how just getting in the shadow of Kepha, Peter, would cause people to be healed. So there's this place where God wants to lock us into where heaven is felt all the time. Where people can come and receive from heaven through us. As if we become these doors. When Yeshua said he is the way, he is the door. Amen. Talking about this door that he can open. He has the keys that opens and no one can lock it. And that locks that no one can open. And so we become these types of doors to the kingdom of heaven. Amen. The new Jerusalem. We become like the city of God. Like God lives in this city. And you can make a connection with God through these emissaries, these ambassadors from the city of God, which is the new Jerusalem. Amen? When an ambassador sets up in a foreign country, that 
property that he's on becomes, if he's an ambassador of the U.S., that becomes uh, United States soil. And they put the flag on it. And if you touch him, you just touched the U.S. of A. Amen. And so you start a war with him, you start a war with the whole army. Navy, Air Force, Marines, whatever it is that we need, you, that's what you just got. You started some, now it's going to be some. Amen? That one person is backed up um, by a whole country. It's the same when the person who, let's say there was a the time where Daniel got the signet ring. There was a time when Joseph got the signet ring. Amen? When they had these signet rings, that meant that that whole kingdom, when Joseph wore that signet ring, that whole kingdom of Egypt, Pharaoh and all his armies were backing him up. So even if you saw him by himself, you see that ring, you see that necklace, you see that staff, you see the king of kings backing him up. Amen? It's the same with Daniel. The Babylonian kingdom, largest one in the land at that time, the empire of, at that time, the Egyptian empire at that time. God puts his people in positions where they get to hold a ring. And so that ring means that you mess with him, you just touch the king of kings. Amen. And there's going to be a reckoning. Amen. And so that's what this new Jerusalem is about. It's about us ambassadors setting up a place in this earth where God is represented and he is able to have access to and affect it. Amen. He's affecting the whole area as to where this one person has come and says, wherever your, the soles of your feet shall touch, I will give it to you. What he's really making reference to is that wherever your feet touch, I'm going to take it over. Like where you walk, I'm going to walk. Amen? And so, so now he's getting access into enemy territory, if you will, through earthen vessels. Amen? It's a beautiful thing. It's powerful. It's very strategic. Amen? It's like very tactical. Amen? God is a, is a, a man of war. I mean, he's got this thing figured out. He's able to hide right amongst the enemy. <laughs> and the enemy don't even see it. Amen? He, he's hiding the, the king of kings and the lord of lords over in Egypt. The house of slavery. Moshe being raised up in the Pharaoh's house. And he's the one who's going to deliver all of his slaves, the Pharaoh's slaves, from his daddy. Or his adopted daddy. <laughs> or his adopted uh, brother, if you know, depending on how you look at it. You know, the, the one Pharaoh dies and the other Pharaoh gang is over. But, I mean... He inherits it from the other one. So any way you look at it, God has put his man right in the enemy's palace and had the enemy raise him up and had the enemy pay his mama <laughs> to do it. You know, God is amazing. Amen. So, so new Jerusalem, right? It's us. Man, God wants to write his name of his city on us. Let's look at that right quick. In uh, chapter 3 of Revelation. The revelation of Yeshua, the Messiah, to Yochanan. In verse uh, 12, it says, I will make him who wins the victory a pillar in the temple of my God. He will never leave it. Also, I will write on him the name of my God, the name of my God's city. The new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from my God and my own new name. Those who have ears, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the Messianic communities. Amen. There's more than one community. There's more than one group of us. But yet we all believe in the same Messiah. I'm not saying that every religion out there is believing in the same Messiah. I'm saying that all... All of the Lord's sheep that hear his voice and that don't listen to another and don't obey another. We're not all in the same place. We're not all in the same fold. We're not all of the same tribe. And yet we all have the one Messiah. We all serve the one living God. Amen. So, so um, 
there's room for some variations. Amen. <laughs> Black Jews, Puerto Rican Jews, uh, white Jews, Mexican Jews, um, you know, Australian Jews, uh, Aborigine Jews, African Jews, uh, Native American Jews, um, believing on the Lord, just trusting in the God of the Hebrews, trusting and keeping and observing and doing his covenant. Amen. That's what makes us Jews, not the fact that we actually live over in the Middle East. Although I thank God for those who were of that Middle Eastern, um, the people who wrote this Bible, you know, those Middle Eastern Jews that God put it in their hearts to write these words and to preserve them for us. I thank God and I'm very grateful for that. Amen. But it's a spiritual thing first and foremost. Amen. It was never supposed to be about a race. It was never supposed to be about a cut on your skin. Amen. It was always supposed to be about a circumcision of the heart. Amen. Many people who are Jews would ask me when I start saying things like Shabbat Shalom and, and Happy Passover and uh, Happy Pesach or something like that. And they would say, or I'd say something like Rosh, uh, Rosh Hashanah. And they'd say, are you Jewish? You know, which it seems strange because if somebody, if a white person came up to me and said, yo, what's up, bro? I wouldn't be like, are you black? <laughs> you know, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> so, so when they say, are you Jewish? It's like, whoa, there's something else about this Jewish. It's not just a race. It's actually a faith. And it was always intended to be a faith. Abraham, he, the first Hebrew, he was actually a Chaldean. He was um, from, the, from Ur <laughs> of the Chaldees, <laughs> you know. He wasn't a, a Jewish man, if you will, and yet he's the father of Jews. So, amen. So let's look at Revelation chapter 15. It says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and wonderful one, seven angels with seven plagues that are the final ones, because with them God's fury is finished. So that's why this is such a beautiful thing and a great thing. Not that, I mean, you see seven plagues, it's like, oh, no. Nah. But then he's saying, his fury is finished with these. Amen? And these are angels doing these things. It's not about us peoples so much doing things. We are the vessels. We are the landing pads. We are the ones who set up the shop of the ambassadors for the kingdom of heaven to go and do what it's got to do. The angels of God are able to do what they have to do because we are on a particular territory. Our feet have touched a particular territory. Therefore, that territory now belongs to the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Boom. New Jerusalem has descended upon this territory. It says, I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. Those defeating the beast, its image, and the number of its name were standing by the sea of glass, holding harps which God had given them. Now this same sea of glass was seen by Moshe and the elders. Amen. Over in Exodus chapter... Okay, Exodus, Shemot, is in Hebrew, chapter 24. We're seeing the same uh, sea. Uh, over verse... We'll start at verse uh, 9. It says, Moshe, Ahira, Nadav, Avihu, the 70 elders went up, and they saw the God of Israel under his feet, something like a sapphire stone pavement, as clear as the sky itself. He did not reach out his hand against these notables of Israel. On the contrary, they saw God even as they were eating and drinking. So they had communion with God right here in the Old Covenant, chapter 24 of Exodus. Amen. So let's go back to Revelation 15, and let's finish this, this uh, New Jerusalem uh, revelation. I, I'm telling you, something about this teaching that 
I feel, well, even just teaching about the government of God, I've been feeling this breakthrough because that's what the Lord told his apostles to teach. He said, when you go, say that the kingdom of God is at hand. And then cast out devils, heal the sick, raise the dead, open up blind eyes. Uh, freely you receive, freely you give. Amen. So that's what this message about the kingdom of God has to do with the covenant of God. And the covenant of God, where the covenant is, God's temple is. Where God's temple is, God is. That's God's city. Amen. That's God's kingdom. And God is able to move and operate in that kingdom the way he did in Acts chapter 5. Amen. Even shadow of Kepha, Peter, would fall upon people and they would be healed and delivered of uh, unclean spirits. Amen. Okay, so verse, I'll start in verse 2. I'll start in verse 2 again. Chapter 15 of Revelation. Verse 2, it says, I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire, those defeating the beast's image and a number of his name, standing by the sea of glass, holding harps which God had given them. God had given them harps. Amen. These stringed instruments. They were singing the song of Moshe, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Amen. One song. Moshe, the Lamb. One song. Amen. And uh, over in Yochanan chapter 1, there's this, um, this verse where it says Moshe came teaching the law. And then in the King James it says, but Yeshua came teaching grace and truth or preaching grace and truth. But that but is not in there. There is no but. It's one continuation. It's over here in verse, okay, here in verse... Uh, 17 of chapter 1 of the book of John, Yochanan in the Hebrew, says, For the Torah was given through Moshe. Grace and truth came through Yeshua, the Messiah. Now, in the King James, it reads slightly different, but this slight difference makes a huge difference in the understanding because it's, it sets one up against the other. And they're never set against the other. There's a continuation. It says, For the law was given by Moshe. But, see that but is in, in italics. That means it's not really there. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, or Yeshua the Messiah. And so, there's, well, I made this reference to, over in Revelation chapter 15, it says they're singing the song of Moshe and of the Lamb. Well, this right here is... Okay, it said it's one song. This right here is one continuation. The Torah given through Moshe, grace and truth came through Yeshua the Messiah. Torah, grace and truth, all the same thing. Torah brings you to grace and truth. Doing the covenant brings you to that repentance that allows you to stop sinning against God and receive forgiveness of sins. Amen. So, so it's one song. Amen. It's not two different songs over here in Revelation 19. It's one song of the Lamb and of Moshe. I'm sorry, Revelation 15. That's what we're reading, Revelation 15. We'll get to 19 later. Okay. So it says, Great and wonderful are the things you have done. We're in verse 3 of Revelation chapter 15. Says they were singing the song of Moshe, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. One song. Great and wonderful are the things you have done, Yahweh, God of heaven's armies. Just and true are your ways. Someone has a near ear, nose, and throat infection. Some stuffing on the right side of your nose. And God is ministering to that. And healing you of that discomfort, that dis-ease. Yahweh will not fear Yahweh, who will not fear and glorify your name? Because you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you. For your righteous deeds have been revealed. After this, I look, and the sanctuary, that is the tent of witness in heaven, was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels, and with the seven plagues, they were dressed 
in clean bright linen and had gold belts around their chest. Now these angels are coming out of the tent of witness in heaven or the sanctuary in heaven which we represent that tent. It says, Know ye not that your bodies are the temples or the tents of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And so we be in those tents, meaning that the Holy Ghost is dwelling, which means that we are this type of New Jerusalem, which means that this sanctuary is within us, which means the angels are connected to that thing, and they're coming out of there with these seven plagues, and they're dressed, amen, with bright linen and gold belts around their chest. All of this is connected to the kingdom of heaven, the new Jerusalem that is within us. Amen? All of this is within us. So we have to stop looking at this as something that's going to happen in the future and connect to it right here, right now. Now, this might look like a whole bunch of different things. This might look like somebody um, giving you a hard time about you just um, getting married. Right? They don't want to see you married. You got a new job. Somebody giving you a hard time. They're hating on you for having a new job. This looks like a whole bunch of different things. Um, and so, a part of what allows us to have that joy that the apostles had for going through some suffering of disgrace for the glory of his name's sake is to being able to identify what's really going on. You know? You know, what's really behind all this haterade that I'm getting from you. You know, what's really behind that? You know, what's really behind all of these blocks that seem to be stopping me from getting what I want? What's really behind that is there's this war going on and the kingdom of heaven is suffering violent and the violent taking it by force. That's what's really going on. It just looks like stuff like unemployment, uh, low income, bad finances, the the economy, it looks like those things to our natural eye, but in the spirit, it looks like seven angels with seven plagues, and they're doing these things because the sanctuary is open, and the sanctuary is open is because the new Jerusalem is descending into this earth realm, and it always gets dark before it gets light. It always gets bad before it gets good. It's always evil taking the first shot before God steps in with the good, amen, and the life, amen. It says, first we were dead, yet we live. <laughs> it says, though you were dead, yet shall you live, amen. So the death comes before the life, amen, whereas in the natural, it looks like we're alive first and then we die, but in the spirit, we're dead first and then we come to life because we don't come to life until we confess Amen. We got to confess what we believe in our hearts. And that confession has to do with us observing, keeping, and doing the covenant. If what you say with your lips, not lining up with what you're doing, then you're just lying. You're lying to yourself. Amen. Okay. Let's go to verse, let's go back to verse 4. It says, Yahweh. Who will not fear and glorify your name? Because you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you. For your righteous deeds have been revealed. After this I looked in a sanctuary. That is the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came seven angels with the seven plagues. These seven plagues. Seven being the number of finish. Being the number of, of covenant. Of completion and rest. I'm sorry, not covenant. Covenant is number ten. But seven is the number of the oath, and it's the number of rest. Amen. It says they had, they were dressed in clean, bright linen and had gold belts around their chest. One of the four living beings gave to the seven angels seven gold bowls. So gold represents God's um, presence, God's purification, God's love. Amen. The essence of God. Amen. Which which um, in the bigger sense has to do with God's love. Amen. It says these gold love, these bowls of love, filled with the fury of God, who lives forever and ever. See, it's, it's out of God's love that this vengeance is taken on evil. It's not that God is furious toward people. God is furious toward the enemy, toward darkness, 
and all of the pain and the suffering that the enemy has afflicted his people on. Even though it might seem like God is all cool and standing back and is like, all right, go ahead, Satan. Have you tried my servant Job? I'm unfaithful like him and all the earth. Go ahead and try him. All right, it's cool. Just don't take his life. All right, it's all good. It's all cool. No, God is furious about that. You think God is just, all right, cool. You sure you're going to get up on that cross? It's going to be good. Three days later, bang, bang, bang. I'm bringing it back. All right, it's all good. No, God is so furious about that that he's... Uh, that is thundering, you know, it's like he's crying about this thing. It's like he's he's renting his own clothes, his own, the veil rent from top to bottom. That's him renting his own garment. He's furious about this, amen, because of his love. You think God in his love is, oh, yeah, I know your heart. I, I understand. I know you're not a bad person. I know you don't keep my covenant and you don't keep my commands, but I know you got a good heart. No, God is not like that. You know, God is, is furious toward that rebellious spirit, not you, the re one who is following the rebellious spirit. No, God is furious toward the rebellious spirit and the witchcraft and all this, these occult practices and these homosexual rituals of, and prostitutions. He's furious against those unclean spirits that are influencing some of his children, leading some of his children astray. God is furious about those things, but it's in love. He's loving his people. He's loving his kids to the last breath. God is loving on his kids. Amen? Those are his kids, and he wouldn't deny them or renounce them for anything. And yet, we as his kids set up these walls of rebellion and self-destructive ways where we can receive from his hand. His hand is constantly extended, but we can't receive because we've got our back turned. And not only that, we build up a wall before we turn our back just to make sure that he can't get through it. Amen. It's a sad, it's a sad thing coming from, from God's perspective. I can see why the Lord is weeping over the multitudes. As sheep without a shepherd. I see that and I feel that. How he's moved with compassion. And yet at the same time. He has made these rules. That he has to abide by. Now he says I'm going to have mercy. On whom I have mercy. You know. that's the, I'm going to do that. And yet. He makes up these. These situations. As to. To whom is he. Allowing himself. To have mercy on. He allows himself to have mercy on anyone who will receive the, the blood covenant sacrifice of Yeshua, the Messiah. Anybody who will receive what he did on that cross for our salvation, taking away the sins of the world. Amen. Anyone who will call upon that name, that character, and follow him and become his disciple, he will have mercy on that person. Amen. It's a guarantee. There is no one who is able to come to the Lord with a sincere heart and God not have mercy. That is an impossibility. It cannot and will not ever happen. And I can sense God's love. It's like the atmosphere just changed to a very soothing, comforting, warm, and, and wooing kind of love from this uh, breaker's anointing kind of, of uh, expression of this love. Amen. God is love. And God does love all of us. There is no one that God is mad at. Amen. No body, no human body that God is mad at. He is very angry at the enemy and every unclean spirit. There is an enmity against, a warring against every unclean spirit that will come to suppress, oppress, depress, regress his people. Amen. His sons. He's very jealous of his people, of his sons. Amen. And there's disappointments. He may be disappointed, and yet even in that, he already knows what's going on in you. He already knows what he put in you to work with. And that's what brings about the disappointments. When he told Moshe, to send the spies into the lamb and uh, into the land, and ten come back with a bad report. That's very disappointing for God because He know those are Abraham's kids, and He know what He put in Abraham. He put in Abraham something that three hundred men with Abraham went and took down 
five kings. He knows what he put in Abraham. You know, he knows this. And because of that, it's like you're supposed to be looking like your granddaddy. And you don't look like your granddaddy. And that's very disappointing to God. Amen. So therefore, none of y'all get to go in. Except the two that look like them. Because y'all are imposters. Y'all been assimilated to, to, the, uh, to the house of bondage of Egypt. You, you assimilate in Egypt. You got this slave mentality. Now I need Abraham, uh, this king Abraham, the father of many nations. The one who is, is, um, who is um, I made the covenant with. I'm going to need that one and people that look like him that I'm going to bring into this promised land. Not those with this slave mentality. Amen. Okay, so let's get back to this. Um, verse 7. It says, One of the four living beings gave, gave to the seven angels seven gold bowls filled with the fury of God, who lives forever and ever. Then the sanctuary was filled with smoke from God Shekinah, that is, from his power, and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels had accomplished their purpose. Amen. Till so this love accomplished its purpose. Now, these plagues are against the enemy. That's why the Lord says, before he even ascended, amen, he sent them like on a test run. He sent them out two by twos. He said, I'm giving you this authority over every unclean spirit to cast them out. Now go do your thing. You know, go and cast them out. Go and heal some sick. Go raise some dead. Open up some blind eyes. You know, freely you give. Freely I gave you. You know, you received it freely enough. Give it freely. Amen. But um, it's like it was a test run. Like I'm giving you authority over unclean spirits to cast them out. Not to talk to them. Not to try to bargain with them. No. Cast them out. Send them out of this situation. Don't just stand there and cope with it. No. Kick them out. Right? You are representing me and my kingdom. And this kingdom here that God is setting up, this new Jerusalem, has a standard. It has a constitution. And anything, the scripture says, try every spirit. If any spirit is not lining up with those Ten Commandments, it's got to go. Amen. That's why he say meditate on them. Just in meditating on the Ten Commandments will start making every unclean spirit that's not wanting to line up with it, make it start loosening up this hole and it's got to go. Amen. You feel yourself under some pressure. You feeling yourself feeling like doing something that's breaking covenant. Start talking about the covenant. Just speak it out loud. Just meditate on it. Start thinking about it. And that conscious, that sin consciousness. Amen will be cleansed away. It's cleansed by the blood, but is we exercise it, amen, and we strengthen and discipline ourselves by meditating on that covenant. And because God wrote it on our mind and in our hearts, because of that, we're able to do it. And because of that, we're, we submit to God and we're able to resist the devil. And because of that, because we're able to resist the devil, he has to flee. He don't have a choice. He can't, he can't hang around in the light. You know, like them vampires, they get in sunlight, they get burned. Right? He can't hang around in the light. He got to go. You turn on a light switch, all the darkness going somewhere. You know, you see some shadows, but it's light now. It got to go. Turn off the light, boom, darkness there. Turn on the light, darkness gone. Amen. God's word, his covenant, his Ten Commandments is the light. It's the light of the world that became flesh. Yeshua HaMashiach is the Ten Commandments. Amen. He is the, the testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach is the spirit of prophecy. Amen. Every prophecy that God is speaking is lining up with these Ten Commandments. So any prophecy that you hear, if it's not lining up with those Ten Commandments, it's a devil talking. And you need to resist listening to that. Amen. If it's lining up with the covenant, you can receive it as truth. If it's disagreeing with the covenant, with the Ten Commandments, it's a lie. It's a lie. You just leave it according to this Bible, according to the God of the Hebrews, according to the God of this um, holy scriptures, this holy collection of books from Genesis through Revelation. Um, if that spirit is saying something contrary, to the Ten Commandments is lying. 
Amen. I don't care what kind of name it has up on this building, what kind of uh, church denomination um, is represented. If it's not lining up with the Ten Commandments, it's lying. It's a lie. It's from the pit of hell. It's that that queen who was sitting on her throne, that queen Babylon, that harlot Jezebel, whatever you want to call it, the spirit of anti-Messiah, the spirit of Antichrist. It's lying. You need to not listen to it. Amen. That's all I'm going to say about that. Okay. So, now this, uh, this Shekinah filling up the the sanctuary so that no one could even stand in it until the the plays of the seven angels had accomplished their purpose. This same type of thing is going on in Exodus chapter 35 and Second Second Corinth uh, Second Chronicles, sorry, um, chapter 5, 11 through 6, 2. So let's look at that briefly. Exodus chapter 40. We're going to see it with Moshe when he finished setting up the tabernacle. Verse 35. It says, Moshe was unable to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud remained on it and the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. Amen. So that's, that same situation is going on because they're, they're cleaning it. They got to cleanse this thing. They got to get these unclean spirits from out of this territory, from out and around it. Um, so, amen. Let's go to Second Chronicles chapter 5. This is when the, after Shlomo, Solomon, had built the, the real deal. You know, instead of just a tent, he built a house. It took him quite a few years to build it. All right, chapter 5, verse 13, it says, uh, verse 13 says, Then when the trumpeters and the singers were playing in concord to be heard harmoniously praising and thanking Yahweh, and they lifted their voices together with trumpets, cymbals, and other musical instruments to praise Yahweh, for he is good, for his grace continues forever, then the house, the house of Yahweh, was filled with a cloud, so that because of the cloud, the Kohanim, the priest, could not stand up to perform their service for the glory of Yahweh filled the house of God. And then it says, Shalomo said, Yahweh said he would live in thick darkness, but I have built you a magnificent house, a place where you can live forever. And then the king turned around and blessed the whole community of Israel. The whole community of Israel stood as he said, Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Israel, who spoke to my father David with his mouth and fulfilled his promise with his hand. He says, Since the day I brought my people out of Egypt, I chose no city from any of the tribes of Israel to build a house so that my name might be there. Nor did I choose anyone to be leader of my people Israel, but now I have chosen Yerushalayim. Right? The new Jerusalem is what God is seeking to do. So that my name can be there. And I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. It was in the heart of David, my father, to build a house for the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel. But Yahweh said to David, my father, although it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you will not build a house. Rather, you will father a son and it will be he who will build a house for my name. Now, this is prophesying about you, Yeshua. Amen. Yeshua is the son of David. Right? That's what they call him. Amen. Yeshua, son of David. Have mercy on me. It says, Now Yahweh has fulfilled this spoken word of his, for I have succeeded my father to sit on the throne of Israel. As Yahweh promised, I have built the house for the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel. And there I have placed the ark containing the covenant of Yahweh, which he made with the people of Israel. So, purpose of the house, the covenant, so that it can contain the covenant. And here we see that the glory of God, the Shekinah glory, filled the house so that they couldn't stand up and perform their service. Now, this revelation, right, the revelation of Yeshua, given to Yochanan, explains to us why. And it's because of these seven angels, the Lord. 
Lord is ministering to some ear, nose, and throat infections. Be healed in the presence of Yeshua. Draining down from your nose into your throat. Be healed. Sometimes when I'm sensing these words, it really affects me. And so, I know I didn't come with it. So, I have to um, speak it out so that the Lord can do what he's touching me that he's doing. Amen. It's being touched with the infirmities of the peoples. And so it's a word of knowledge, but I feel it in my body. And sometimes it feels like, whoa, it's pretty strong. Like it, I actually react to it. But anyway, receive your healing in the presence of Yeshua. Amen. Let's look at uh, chapter 19 of Revelation. I have a few minutes left here. And so this chapter is a little bit longer. It says, after these things, I heard what sounded like the roar of a huge crowd in heaven shouting, Hallelujah, the victory, the glory, the power of our God, for his judgments are true and just. He has judged the great whore who corrupted the earth with her whoring. He has taken vengeance on her who has the blood of his servants on her hands. And a second time they said, Hallelujah, her smoke goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living beings fell down and worshiped God. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, sitting, they, they worshiped God sitting on a throne and said, Amen. Hallelujah. A voice went out from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants. You who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what sounded like the roar of a huge crowd, like the sound of a rushing waters, like loud peals of thunder, saying, Hallelujah, Yahweh, God of heaven's armies, has begun his reign. Remember, we're talking about the new Jerusalem. He has begun his reign. When that new Jerusalem has been established in the earth, at that point, he has begun his reign. Amen. Right now, we are not seeing necessarily his reigning, his reigning supreme. We are seeing an establishing of his reigning supreme. We are seeing a creating, a building of a place for him to dwell so that he can reign supreme. But we have not seen him begin to reign until that new Jerusalem has been established here in our lives and in the earth. Let us rejoice and be glad. Let us give him glory, the glory, for the time has come for the wedding of the Lamb. And his bride has prepared herself fine linen, bright and clean, has been given her to wear. Fine linen means the righteous deeds of God's people. The angel said to me, write, how blessed are those who have been invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Then he added, these are God's very words. I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said, don't do that. I'm only a fellow servant with you and your brothers who have the testimony of Yeshua, who have the covenant of Yeshua, the covenant of God, the Ten Commandments. Worship God, for the testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. Next, I saw heaven open, and there before me was a white horse. Sitting on it was the one called Faithful and True. And it is in righteousness that he passes judgment and goes to battle. His eyes were like fiery flame, and on his head were many royal crowns, and he had a name written no one knew but himself. He was wearing a robe that had been soaked in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God, the Covenant of God, the Ten Commandments. The armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white, pure, were, were following him on white horses, and out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down nations. He will rule them with the staff of iron. It is he who treads the wine press from which flows the wine of the furious rage of Yahweh, God of heaven's armies. And on his robe, and on a thigh, and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried out with a loud voice to all the birds that fly about in mid-heaven. Come, gather together for the great feast God has given. To eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of generals, 
the flesh of important men, the flesh of horses and their riders, the flesh of all kinds of people, free and slave, small and great. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to do battle with the rider of the horse and his army. But the beast was taken captive, and with it the false prophet, who in his presence had done the miracles which he had used to deceive those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped his image. Now, remember I said this is not about future, this is about right now. Receiving the mark of the beast on your hands and on your forehead. 666 represent manifestation, man. Um, it, it represents the works of the flesh of man at its pinnacle. Man trusted in his own abilities is the mark of the beast on the forehead and on the, and on the hands. It has to do with how you think. It has to do with the works that you do. You're representing yourself. You're trying to build yourself a kingdom. You're trying to build yourself uh, a tower that reaches heaven, right? As opposed to establishing the kingdom of God in the earth. As opposed to serving God with your mind and your hands. Amen. Doing good works. Doing the will of God. Doing the Ten Commandments. Instead of keeping Shabbat, you're doing your own thing on Shabbat. That's what the mark of the beast has to do. And those who have that mark are the ones who the false prophet is able to deceive with the miracles. Why? Because they're not in covenant. They're not trying all the spirits. They're not trying these prophecies with the covenant. They're not putting them up to the covenant and seeing if they can stand. They're not doing those things. Amen. It says, The beast and the false prophet were both thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword that goes out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. And all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Amen. This right here, this king of kings and lord of lords being able to do his thing has to do with, with God being um, beginning his reign, which has to do with the sanctuary of God. Amen. The sanctuary of God, the new Jerusalem being established in the earth is when God is able to do these things in the earth. Amen. So, beloved, I'm trusting that God will bless your understanding to receive his living word. May Yahweh bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you, and may Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom.